Hey everyone, today we're going to be doing our chapter 13 notes on achieving energy sustainability. That's going to focus mostly on uh, different forms of renewable energy, um, energy conservation, and energy efficiency. So let's go ahead and begin. And so to start off with, we're going to review uh, what does it mean for an energy source to be renewable. And let me make sure I have a little pen here. Um, we actually have different categories of what we consider to be renewable energy. So here the definition, it says renewable energy can be rapidly regenerated and some can never be depleted no matter how much of them we use. Um, so we kind of divide those into two different categories. We say that um, resources like wood, oops, wood and biofuels uh, could be potentially renewable as long as we're using them at sustainable rates, meaning that we're not um, consuming them faster than we can replenish them. So those would be things like trees and various types of plants. And we'll talk more about um, the various types of biomasses and biofuels a little bit later. <clears throat> but then sources like wind, solar, hydroelectric, which is water, and geothermal, we consider those to be non-depletable, which means we would never run out of these resources. We have infinite amounts of these resources. Um, and then later on when we get especially into biomass and stuff, we'll talk about how developed countries and developing countries use them. Um, but it says here, in the old days of developed countries, um, a lot of our initial fuel sources were things like wood, animal manure, and fish and animal oils. Um, and as we're going to learn in a little bit, a lot of developing countries, these are still some of their main forms of energy. So they do use a lot of biomass and biofuels. Um, and then altogether, renewable energy, oops, only accounts for about 13% of the energy worldwide. And most of this is in the form of biomass, especially in these developing countries, which are still using a lot of wood and manure, um, which again, we said that biomass is only renewable if we use it sustainably, which, um, you know, places like Sub-Saharan Africa, where they're using a lot of wood, uh, they're saying that they're, they are cutting down the trees way more quickly um, then they're able to replenish them. So we do have a lot of these developing places where they're using the biomass uh, unsustainably. Okay, so then just to review our different categories of um, energy sources, your non-renewable sources that we learned about last notes are natural gas, oil, coal, and nuclear. Uh, nuclear comes from uranium, and I'm not sure if we've done these notes yet or not, but we'll, we'll probably be doing these notes in class. Um, but again, these are all finite resources that we have to extract from the ground. Uh, potentially renewable forms of uh, alternative energy would be wood and biofuel, mostly coming from plants. And again, we would need to harvest those sustainably for them to be renewable. And then non-depletable, where we'll never run out of them, would be things like wind, solar, hydroelectric, water, uh, and geothermal, which we'll learn about in our next set of notes. Okay, so as I said at the beginning of these notes, we're going to focus on energy conservation and energy efficiency. So. Uh, we describe the concept of energy conservation as finding ways to use less energy. And there are things that we can do in our daily behaviors around our house and in terms of transportation where we can make an impact on uh, better using energy. So just really simple things like lowering your thermostat during the winter. Um, the EPA recommends if you can lower your thermostat down to like 67 or 68 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter and you know if you get cold just go put on some extra clothes um, that's way more efficient than heating up your entire house because uh, again and we know a lot of our homes are um, great size and they've increased in size very very quickly over the past several decades so that's going to be a much more efficient way to use energy in your house. Um, in terms of driving behaviors, obviously trying to drive fewer miles, and you can do things like consolidate your trips if you need to go run some errands, do them all at the same time, uh, come up with carpooling strategies, we'll talk about slugging and commuter lots and that sort of thing, and HOV lanes later, those are all strategies we're using to decrease the amount of individual cars on the highways. Um, simple things like turning off your computer when not being used, we all know that. Um, they say using laptops is better than desktop computers. Turn them off or put them into sleep mode when you're not using them. And just unplug any sort of electronic from the wall if you're not using it, because we consider those to be energy vampires. And then better availability of public transport. And again, that's something that we're trying to work on in this country. Uh, better facilitation of things like the metro and the buses and the slug lines and those types of things. Um, some kind of top-down things that government can do is they can impose taxes on non-renewables uh, like coal and oil 
and they can offer incentives like rebates or even um, what do you call them tax exemptions uh, for building more energy efficient homes and buildings <clears throat> and then some things that we can do to make uh, things more energy efficient in our homes and we define energy efficiency as getting the same result from using a small amount of energy so basically buying uh, resources better light bulbs better appliances that are going to put more of the incoming energy into the outgoing um, product or service that we desire from it so some ways to make your home more energy efficient would be to buy better light bulbs and we've seen a nice evolution of light bulbs over the past couple decades um, the CFL bulbs the compact fluorescent light bulbs the little swirly looking bulbs those are um, way more energy efficient than incandescent light bulbs they only use a quarter um, as much energy as an incandescent light bulb and then LEDs are even more efficient they're said to use only one-sixth of the amount of energy as a as an incandescent light bulb so the LEDs are kind of actually taking over the CFL world uh, and then switching to energy star appliances in your homes which again they're going to use more of the energy coming in to do the service that you want it to do so energy efficient um, washing machines dryers dishwashers all of those things and again if you, if you live in a newer home in this area you your house probably came equipped with a lot of energy star appliances and then just to be aware of some of the least efficient devices that we can use around our houses would be those old school incandescent light bulbs they are very very energy inefficient and then your traditional old school vehicle that has an internal combustion engine and so we'll talk about a, a better route to go in terms of vehicles would be uh, your hybrid vehicles your electric vehicles maybe in the future your hydrogen fuel cell vehicles um, so that's where we're headed Okay, and so uh, again, a lot of these we just talked about, ways to make your home more energy efficient, make sure they're weatherized, make sure that they're insulated, and again, a lot of these new homes in this area, they, they come built with these um, special insulated techniques where they, they do the traditional insulation and then they wrap it with the plastic wrap. Um, you're sealing any gaps, making sure you don't have any leaks in your doors and windows, turning the thermostat down in the winter, turning it up in the summer. Um, anytime you're using hot water in the house, see if you can do without the hot water. So laundry and colder water, shorter showers, not as hot of showers or baths. And we already talked about this with the light bulbs. Transportation, obviously avoiding, you know, riding in an individual car by yourself. So walking or riding a bike carpooling, consolidating trips, taking more public transportation, and then around the home, Energy Star appliances and devices, uh, unplug things from the wall, and uh, using a laptop instead of a desktop is better. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some stuff in terms of power plants and the electrical grid. Um, and one of the things we need to know when we're talking about a power plant, and actually let me go ahead to this picture. I just want to show you, we're going to be talking about electrical grids and how that works, but I just want to go over this. I think we went over this last notes, but I just want to remind you how all this goes down, how we actually generate the um, electricity, and then how it actually makes its way to your home. So whenever we generate electricity, it's going to come from a power plant or from a power station. And a lot of the electricity generated in the U.S. comes from coal-fired power plants, um, and that's no different up in this area. We do get a lot of electricity from coal fire power plants in this region. A lot of our electricity in Northern Virginia, um, surprisingly, comes from nuclear power. We have a nuclear power plant down near Lake Anna. Some of you guys have probably been down there. Um, but anyways, you have all these power stations that generate electricity, doing the whole turbine thing that we learned about, and then they're gonna send that electricity um, through power lines to these transformers and they go through a series of different transformers and substations <clears throat> before they make their way to your home through these um, power cords and some of these transformers are actually going to boot up the voltage and they say the reason that they actually bring the voltage levels up is so that you get better efficiency along the lines so you're not losing as much um, energy as they go through the lines so some of these things boot up the voltage so they raise it up and they go through these lines and then they come to these substations and again these might boot it up or they might actually boot it down but by the time they get close to residential areas in your home 
they are going to bring the voltage down. And so if we were following this all the way to your house, we would come to your power lines and we'd come to something like this. If you have power lines above ground, you might see something like this. And that is, they call it a um, pad mount transformer or an overhead transformer. Um, the one that's right near your home is going to bring the voltage down to like 120 volts to 240 volts. It's going to be low enough to power your small appliances in your house. Um, if you have underground power lines, you probably see your transformers outside looking like these little box shaped things. It's the same idea. They're going to bring the voltage level down to suit the needs of the smaller um, appliances in your home. Okay, so that's the whole shebang. You go from generating the electricity at the power plant or the power station, go through a series of power lines, change the voltage levels as needed, and they eventually make their way to your house or to a business or what have you. Um, this whole thing we consider the, the electrical grid or the power grid. Okay, so let's go back to a couple slides. And so with our energy providers, they have to take some things into consideration when they provide electricity for us. Um, one of the issues we have to deal with is what we call peak demand. And that's going to be a certain time of day or a certain time of year where you have the greatest quantity of energy being used all at one time. And you can probably imagine when that's going to be. Um, that in our area is said to be between June and September from the time periods of about like 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and the problem is you've got all this air conditioning running and you've got all these people that are requiring all this electricity the electric company has to be able to provide enough energy to satisfy everyone. They can't just not do that. Um, so sometimes you do have issues where you have power outages because of that. Um, we call these, you can have brownouts and blackouts. So it says a brownout is when the power does not meet peak demand, but the grid does not completely fail. So it's not completely shut down. And a blackout is when you have a power plant or a grid malfunction and you may, you may have lost power. Um, so in order to avoid these sorts of things, uh, energy companies usually have some sort of extra backup source of energy available to meet that peak demand when it occurs, and it's usually in the form of some sort of like natural gas fired generator. So they have to build this whole extra facility just to supplement all the extra power they're going to need during peak demand. And that's not a very sustainable idea because we are only using it intermittently. We're, you know, it's not something that's being used all the time. So power companies don't like having to do that and it's something that costs all of us more money. So they've devised all these strategies to help um, the consumers out and also help the companies out as well. And they do stuff like a variable price structure where the utility customers can pay less energy or they can pay less money to use energy when the demand is lowest. That's typically going to be overnight or on the weekends when you're not in peak demand. But if you do use a lot of your energy during peak demand, you're probably going to be paying higher costs. Um, <clears throat> if people work to not use energy during peak demand time, it can help to reduce stress on the company and will reward consumers at the same time because the prices would go down. So uh, Novec is the company that provides Northern Virginia with electricity. They've devised all these um, different strategies to encourage people to use more energy during the non-peak hours um, so that we can help with these issues. <clears throat> Okay, and so I already pointed out what the electrical grid is. It's just that series of lines that's, take, that's taking the electricity from the power plant to the homes and the businesses. It says, in a typical fossil fuel or nuclear power plant, only a third of the energy consumed goes towards the intended purpose, meaning it gets to the home or gets to the business. The rest is lost during energy conversions, and we know that due to the second law of thermodynamics. <clears throat> and let me see if there's anything else I wanted to talk about before we go on to the next thing. Yes. Okay. Let me go back to this. Just a couple other things I wanted to talk about in terms of our region and the electrical grid. <clears throat> uh, let's see. We already talked about Novec and the transformers. Um, so I mentioned earlier that most power plants in the U.S. get their electricity from burning coal. Um, Novec, located in Northern Virginia, um, we get elect some electricity from coal, we get a lot of our electricity from the power plant down at Lake Anna, and I have a lab activity where we're actually going to look at what percentages of our energy come from which sources. 
Um, so it's kind of cool because it makes it very local and relevant to us. So we have coal, we have nuclear, but also Novec prides itself on trying to come up with alternative and renewable forms of energy to put on their grid. Um, so Novec says that they do buy some electricity from hydropower facilities in the area, which is water, water power, and we'll learn about that on our next set of notes. And they also buy some electricity from landfill gases, and our very own local landfill actually does its own process where it collects methane gas that develops from the decomposition of the trash and methane is a combustible gas so they actually burn it off and make electricity from it and they actually use that electricity to power their whole landfill facility as well as some surrounding areas um, so Novec, our electrical company they buy some landfill gas electricity as well and then something really exciting about Novec is they've helped to construct a biomass power plant in Halifax and we buy electricity from them um, they say that they believe it supplies about 6.5 percent of Northern Virginia's electricity just from that one biomass plant. So again we're trying to find ways to bring some renewable energy into our electrical grid, um, kind of diversifying our portfolio so it's not just from coal burning power plants or nuclear power plants we're trying to diversify. Um, and something that uh, customers can do <clears throat> maybe some of your parents already do this, is you can actually buy renewable energy credits. And they say it doesn't really raise your monthly bill that much. It might only raise your monthly bill by like $15, but you buy renewable energy credits and that would help our area move towards getting more renewable energy onto our electrical grid. So something kind of cool that you can think about doing maybe when you're older and you have your own home. Okay, so we'll move on now. I just think that stuff's pretty cool. All right, so in the next section, we're going to talk uh, more about like house and building design, uh, sustainable design. So it says this is just defined as improving the efficiency of buildings that we live and work in. Um, we can do something that's called passive solar design. I'll show you guys some pictures. It's not the next two slides because I moved this around, but I'll show you some pictures of what passive solar design looks like. It's just using smart techniques to build a home. Uh, but some other things you can do to help. Uh, design more sustainable buildings is to make sure that they're super insulated and we talked about that earlier. Um, coming up with more energy efficient ways to heat the houses uh, because I don't know if I've mentioned this yet but the number one energy hog in our homes uh, are our HVAC systems, the heating and the cooling. They use so much energy so if we can find ways to improve that that's going to save us a lot of money and save us a lot of energy. So passive solar heating, like I said, I'll show you that here in a moment. Um, high efficiency natural gas furnaces. Gas, natural gas furnaces are much better than um, electrical furnaces. And again, most new houses in this area probably have natural gas furnaces as opposed to electric. Um, for existing homes, add the newly updated insulation. Make sure you don't have any leaks. Um, energy saving windows are going to be like your double paned windows. Those are going to keep um, cold air from getting in or vice versa. Uh, use the most energy efficient ways to heat water. Um, second to your HVAC systems, your water heaters are the biggest energy hog. We call them the biggest energy hog of household appliances. Um, and there's a couple of different types of water heaters kind of the old school ones that a, like a lot of older houses have they're the large storage tank water heaters and the reason they use so much energy is because you're storing a huge tank of water and you're heating that huge tank of water all day and all night long so that you have hot water on command as soon as you turn on the hot water faucet um, so yeah you can imagine what a big energy waste that is the alternative to that they're coming up with these new tankless and instant water heaters. Uh, they're very small. They say they're about the size of a suitcase and it literally sucks in cold water. As soon as you turn on the hot water faucet, it sucks in the cold water and it insta heats it. So it's hot water right on demand, but it hasn't been sitting in a tank and it hasn't been heated all day long. Um, using natural gas to heat water is always going to be better than using um, like electrical coils and that sort of thing. Um, so even if you do have one of the larger storage tank water heaters, having a natural gas flame to heat it is better than electrically heating it. <clears throat> and again, we already talked about this, use your more uh, energy efficient appliances and lights in your home. And then the government was offering rebates and tax credits uh, for a while there. They were offering big time deals if you went in and bought 
energy star appliances. And I'm not sure if they're doing that too much now anymore or not, but I was reading there are um, a couple main things that they still are giving pretty good tax incentives and rebates for. And that's going to be kind of large scale things. If you ins install something like a solar energy system at your home, if you put solar panels, um, or even just put solar panels on your garage if you have an electric car and you can kind of use that as a way to power up your electric car you can get good tax incentives for that. Um, also installing small residential wind turbines. Uh, I guess people are doing that and you can get good tax credits for that. And then the last thing is installing geothermal heat pumps which is a little bit more um, intensive, I guess you could say, and we'll talk more about geothermal in our next set of notes. Uh, but those are, again, kind of some big scale projects you would do to your house, but you can get some pretty good government um, tax credits and rebates for doing those things. Okay, so let's talk about um, energy and transportation here in a second. Um, obviously, trying to find better cars that are more fuel efficient, that would be a, a really good way to save energy and transportation. Uh, some are arguing, especially in countries like ours, when gas is so cheap, there's not a whole lot of incentive for people to buy more energy efficient vehicles. You still see a lot of huge SUVs and vans and stuff out there. And you go to other countries where their gas is much more expensive. Uh, a lot of Europe, the gas is very, very expensive compared to ours. So they drive smaller cars. Uh, a lot of people don't even own cars. They rely more on public transportation. So, you know, quite a few politicians in our country are saying, you know, maybe we shouldn't be making gas so cheap, and maybe that's the push that people need um, to buy more fuel-efficient vehicles. Um, but, you know, we have seen rising gas prices within the last couple decades, and that has been a push for some people, especially people who commute every day, um, to look into things like electric cars and hybrid cars. So we've got lots of different categories of energy efficient cars. So your electric car is going to be the ones that are strictly plug-in. You know, there's no gasoline going into them at all. Um, you plug them in and you charge up the battery, hopefully at night during non-peak hours. And it says the pollution to recharge batteries is produced elsewhere. So that's one of the arguments against these is, okay, you know, your fuel that you use for a, a regular car with an internal combustion engine um, is going to be your gasoline that you get at the gas station, which comes from petroleum. But if you're plugging in your car at your house, you had to get that electricity from somewhere. And again, probably a lot of that electricity came from a coal burning power plant or a nuclear power plant or something like that. So they're saying the pollution to recharge batteries is going to be elsewhere. Basically, you're just putting the blame or you're putting the issue elsewhere. If you want an electric car to be truly sustainable and be truly energy efficient, you would need to make sure that the energy that it used when you plug it in is coming from a renewable source. So some people actually create these little garages that have solar panels on top of them, and the solar panel on top of it will collect energy during the day, and that's the energy that they're going to use to, to charge up their car at night. And so that's, that's an excellent idea. Um, one that's very, very popular, and we'll probably see it in our presentations, is going to be the Tesla Roadster sports car. Very hot, people love it. Um, it's very expensive, it's a high-end sports car, but it's awesome. Um, hybrid cars, that's going to be a car that runs on both the internal combustion engine, so your typical gasoline, but then also they have electric motors with batteries uh, that can be charged in a couple of different ways. You could either plug them into your garage, like just like the electric cars, or they've got this thing that's called regenerative braking, where every time you hit the brakes, it's going to help to charge the battery. So that's a really cool idea, and those are pretty popular uh, even in this area. Uh, something that is just kind of being worked on at this point, it's, I don't want to say it's futuristic, but they're saying we're probably not going to see these mainstream for a while, are your hydrogen fuel cell cars. Uh, they run on hydrogen fuel cell technology, which I'll talk about in our next set of notes. Um, but again, that's, that's not mainstream yet. It might be the future of vehicles, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, so some other things we can do, it says shift to more energy efficient ways to move people around. Um, such as decreasing in the number of cars on the road. We can do that through things like carpooling, mass transit, public transit, uh, walking, biking. And right now, the type of transportation that uses the most energy are going to be your highway vehicles, meaning people who commute to work from the suburbs to the cities in their individual private vehicles. 
um, day in and day out. So if we can reduce the number of individual private highway vehicles, um, that would be one of the best things that we can do to save energy and transportation. Oh, and before we go on to the next thing, I wanted to read you a little bit of the work that's been going on with um, car emissions and car efficiency um, goals and statistics. So, um, I had to do a little bit of research for this. So, and this is coming from the government, um, they have stated that cars that are model year 2016, meaning next year, uh, should meet an estimated combined average of 35 miles to the gallon per car maker. So each of your individual car companies, all of their 2016 models should have an average of 35 miles to the gallon by next year. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then a really ambitious goal by 2025, this is going to go up to 54.5 miles to the gallon. So just in 10 years, the average fuel efficiency for an automaker should be upwards of 50 miles to the gallon. That's amazing. Now, the article I was reading, it says, it says that's not to say the typical car will get anywhere near that mileage in 10 years, especially thinking of larger things like SUVs and that sort of thing. But it gives incentives to the car companies to make these changes um, by doing more of producing uh, zero emission vehicles, because if they make a lot of zero emission vehicles, it's going to bring that average down. Um, so your electric cars, so that's going to be a big incentive for the automakers to make more and more of these types of cars. Uh, if the automakers cannot meet these averages and they have to purchase credits, kind of like a cap and trade type thing. And then just finding other creative ways to take steps to reduce emissions. So these, this is kind of a really big push by our government to have the car makers be creative and come up with ways to lessen um, our emissions coming from our vehicles. Uh, car companies have already made great strides in a short amount of time. Uh, the average mileage of all 2014 release models was suspected to be around 26 miles to the gallon. So that's pretty good, 26 miles to the gallon. Um, some of the best strategies that we're using now uh, to make more um, energy efficient cars would be lighter materials. Uh, I even saw an article that said the Ford F-150s, they are now going to be switching to using aluminum instead of heavier metals. Um, using more of the start-stop technologies that we're seeing in cars, uh, the regenerative braking that I mentioned earlier, and then again looking at the hydrogen fuel cells in the future, but we probably won't see those for a while. Okay, so let's go back to that sustainable design stuff we were talking about with the homes. Um, we mentioned that one thing you can do when you're designing a house or a building is use something that's called passive solar design. Uh, and it says that this is a technique that takes advantage of solar radiation to maintain a comfortable building temperature, can lower the electricity bill uh, without the need for other sort of mechanical devices. So let me show you some pictures and I'll come back and describe these. <clears throat> so here are some strategies that you might use. Um, more skylights in your home, uh, windows facing a certain direction, and I'll go back to that on the, on the previous slide. Uh, energy efficient windows, your double paned windows are going to help to keep energy in or out, whatever you're trying to do. Um, adequate sealing of any sort of cracks and the, the highest tech insulation that you can get. Uh, better insulated foundation and walls uh, and basement floors and high efficiency heating and cooling systems. And so let me go back. And so some other things to think about, or they might be in addition to the things that I just listed, would be to build um, the house with windows along a south-facing wall, which would allow the sun rays to warm the house naturally. Uh, the double pane windows I mentioned, putting darker materials on the roof, which will be better at capturing heat, and then using uh, more building materials that have better what we call thermal inertia. And that means that once they're warmed, they'll stay warmer longer. And once they're cool, they'll stay cooler longer. Um, so they say things, building materials like stone and concrete are going to be way, have way better thermal inertia than something like wood. And then kind of a new idea are these green roofs. Uh, supposedly these are very popular in certain European countries. Uh, we have some in the U.S., which means that you would put soil and plants on the roof of a building, and that can do several different things. It can cool and shade buildings, and these plants also help to filter the air, so they help to improve the air quality. And so I'll show you pictures of all of these things. Here's just a picture of how you can do better sustainable design. 
south facing windows, double paned windows, window shades instead of, you know, air conditioning, heat absorbing floors, an overhang to help um, shade the sun in the summer. So just smart building techniques. And then there's what a green roof might look like. Um, lots of plants and then it says they've also got a nice water capturing system as well that they can use to capture water and then filter it and then use that in their building. Alright, so now we're going to go ahead and move into biomass. This is going to be the last main topic that we'll talk about before um, I end this part one of our notes. So, um, biomass, we need to remember it's going to be energy that originated with the sun and it says and we've talked about this concept a couple of different times this year. The sun is the ultimate source of almost all types of energy on this planet. And the only exceptions are going to be nuclear, geothermal, and tidal energy. But, you know, even things like um, wind and hydropower, those are influenced by the sun. Uh, wind is created by the differential heating of the planet um, by the sun, just the way that the sun hits the planet. If you think back to what we talked about with biomes and the um, convection cells and the air masses, all of that is what drives wind. So without the sun, we wouldn't have these winds. Um, same thing with, with hydropower, the, the water cycle is totally driven by the sun. So the sun really is the ultimate source of most of our energy on the planet. Now, when we talk about different forms of biomass, uh, we can break it up into different categories. Um, <clears throat> wood, charcoal, charcoal which is actually made from wood, uh, animal products and manure, plant remains like crop residues or uh, leftover uh, dead trees from the bottom of forest floor, municipal solid waste, uh, most of that we're going to be talking about well you can actually burn up trash but then also I mentioned uh, the methane gas that we get uh, from the decomposition of the waste that's a combustible gas that we can burn to create energy from. And so these are going to be mostly your solids. And then biofuels we consider to be the liquid fuels that are made from biomass. And we have two main types of biofuels, ethanol, which is alcohol, and biodiesel, which is going to be more of an oily substance. Okay, and then here we just have a nice graphic that kind of breaks down all the different forms of energy. <clears throat> so it reminds us that even fossil fuels your oil, gas, coal, those all got their uh, initial energy from the sun a long time ago, millions of years ago. And then again, solar energy obviously is using energy from the sun. Uh, wind and water energy uh, are influenced by the sun by the differential heating of the planet and the atmosphere. <clears throat> and then you have all of our other types of biomass that are initially getting their energy from the sun down here. And the only non-solar related types of energy is going to be your nuclear um, energy and tidal. Okay. okay, and then before we get more into biomass, I need to talk about uh, modern carbon versus fossil carbon. Uh, this is kind of a, an important topic for us to learn about and we might have mentioned this before when we talked about the carbon cycle but this is really an important reason for why people are pushing us to use biomass instead of things like fossil fuels so um, a lot of people argue you know why would we use biomass when burning biomass like things like wood and plants are going to give off carbon to the atmosphere the same way that burning something like coal would give off carbon to the atmosphere well there's a difference in the timing and we can break it into two different categories. We can say we have modern carbon, which would be your biomass, and your fossil carbon, which would be your fossil fuels. So what we have to think about when we're using biomass, we're using trees and plants, the carbon found in those trees and plants and that biomass was in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide not too long ago. So if it's something like a tree, it might have been a couple hundred years ago that it was carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If it's something like crops, it might have just been weeks ago. Okay, so we're, when we burn off those plants, we're burning off recent modern carbon. We're putting that back into the atmosphere, which again is not great, but it's recent carbon that's been recently circulating. Um, now, when we come down to fossil fuels, it says burning coal is carbon that has been buried for millions of years and it was out of circulation until we began to use it. So it's been out of the carbon cycle for millions of years. It was buried, we very quickly dug it up, brought it to the surface, started burning it off, 
and it says this results in a rapid increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we consider fossil fuels to have contained old fossil carbon that's been stored and buried for millions of years and we're quickly releasing it back to the atmosphere. <clears throat> And it says, any activity in which modern carbon is used, but the biomass is replanted to negate any carbon use, is considered to be carbon neutral. So that's what we, we were saying earlier. If we can use biomass, the modern carbon stuff, in such a way that we're replanting and restoring that carbon just as quickly as we're burning it, burning it off, we can make this a carbon neutral form of technology. Whereas the fossil fuels were, were taking stuff that's been out of the system for a long time and we're pumping it back into the atmosphere very, very quickly. So that's a really important concept to understand. <clears throat> okay, so let's get more into the specifics of biomass. So um, biomass, we said, is like your solids, so things like wood, charcoal, and manure. Uh, they're used to heat homes and for cooking throughout the world, especially important in developing countries. And if we look at the ways that developed countries and developing countries use biomass. Um, in the developed world, they say that we mostly use wood, followed by the methane from the municipal solid waste, or just burning our municipal solid waste as trash, and then biofuels. Those are the main ones the developed world uses. Developing world, it's mostly going to be wood and manure. If they're wealthy enough to be able to afford charcoal, charcoal is a little bit more expensive. But most people in developing world are using wood and manure, and they use that they burn it to heat their homes, they use it to cook. Um, a bad thing about doing this in developing countries, a lot of them are doing this indoors, it creates an awful lot of air pollution in their homes and that creates a lot of respiratory issues and we'll talk more about that with air pollution. But That is a concern for a lot of these developing countries using so much of this. All right, so then when we talk about biofuels, we can divide it up into two different types. We have ethanol, which is like alcohol, and biodiesel, which I said is like an oily type of fuel. Uh, these can be used as substitutes for gasoline and diesel, respectively. So ethanol. Ethanol is just simply alcohol. Uh, it's made through the fermentation process. If you remember from biology, um, alcoholic fermentation, it's that exact same process. So you're taking the sugars from the plant, you're doing respiration, you're turning it into CO2 gas and just straight up alcohol. Okay, it's the same exact process used in breweries, used at vineyards, you're making alcohol. Uh, most ethanol alcohol in the US comes from corn uh, currently, but we can also use things like sugarcane, wood chips, crop waste, and switchgrass to make ethanol. Biodiesel, we mostly uh, produce from extracting oil from algaes, uh, and then also plants like soybeans and palm. Uh, it says policymakers are encouraging these as an alternative to foreign oil and a way to support U.S. farmers. So this is a big push to alternative energy using fuels from plants uh, instead of relying on imports from other countries of fossil fuels. Okay, so let's focus in on ethanol here for a little bit. Um, a lot of our recent administrations, both Bush and Obama, have been pushing big time for more ethanol production in our country, uh, but it's been slow going. But we're still the largest producer worldwide, though. Uh, second to us is Brazil. Brazil does a lot of ethanol production. They have a lot of sugar cane that they can uh, process pretty quickly and easily. And then, as I said, we use mostly corn. Um, something interesting, you may or may not know this, ethanol is already and it has been mixed with gasoline to form what we call gasohol uh, for a long time now. And so the stuff that you're putting into your cars, we actually call it gasohol because it's partly um, ethanol and partly gasoline. So when you look at the pump, when you go to pump your gas next time, look for that sticker. It'll say, you know, attention, this gasoline contains 10% ethanol. Um, you'll notice that, okay? Uh, so, you know, what's the importance of using ethanol and making more ethanol. It says it has a higher oxygen content and so you're going to get less pollutants from burning it off than just gasoline alone. We've actually concocted this new type of fuel. It's called E85. Again, you might have heard of this before. Uh, it's very popular in a lot of your corn growing states. E85 is going to be fuel that's 85 percent ethanol. Sorry about that. So mostly ethanol and only 15 percent gasoline but you have to have a certain type of engine to be able to process that type of fuel. Um, this type of fuel, E85, can be used by cars that are known as 
flex fuel vehicles. So if you have a relatively new vehicle, you might take a look at it and see if it is a flex fuel vehicle. Um, you can actually use E85 fuel in it. And it says here the problem is most people don't know their cars are flex fuel or don't know they can use E85. I will say another issue with this, you got to find a gas station that um, has E85 available. And I will tell you just from researching around the area, I don't see a whole lot uh, that are out there. But hopefully that will change. Uh, some disadvantages of ethanol is that growing corn uses fossil fuels and land that could be devoted to growing food. That is one of the major, major, major issues that people have with biofuels and especially ethanol. If we're using a lot of corn to make this ethanol from, they're saying, you know, that's deal we're dealing with the whole food issue and the land issue. Um, but then again, people who are still like the idea of ethanol, they say, well, we don't have to use corn. We could use stuff like switchgrass instead, but again, we've said that there's some issues with that. They say that switchgrass is mostly cellulose as compared to um, other sugars. It's harder to process. It takes more energy and more processing to make the ethanol. So biodiesel is similar to ethanol, um, except for, like we said, it's more of an oily substance and it's meant to replace um, diesel. We do have a mixture of diesel and biodiesel, and that's going to be called B20. And this is going to be a, a mixture that's 20% biodiesel, which means it's 80% regular diesel. Um, and they say that this type of fuel, the B20, can be used by pretty much any, any person with a standard diesel engine. So if you have a diesel vehicle at home, uh, it should be able to do this mixture. But something that's kind of interesting, they say anybody with a diesel vehicle can purchase a kit. Um, this should say able to run. Make any di diesel vehicle able to run on 100% straight vegetable oil, which can be obtained as a waste product from restaurants and filtered for use as fuel. Uh, it says some communities have a vegetable oil recycling program and run their public buses with the stuff. And I believe we watched a video at the very beginning of the year where I showed you that as well, um, where you can retrofit your diesel vehicle with the stuff and just drive around from restaurant to restaurant, ask them for their tubs of leftover oil, and never have to buy a diesel fuel again, running off of vegetable oil. Uh, it says most biodiesel in the U.S. is made from soybean or vegetable oil. However, working on ways to make it from leftover logging wood and sawmills, which would make it even more sustainable and even more renewable. And then the newest hotness in terms of biodiesel development is with algae. That's where people are getting really excited. Uh, they think that's a, a more environmentally uh, friendly way to make biodiesel. And then your pros and cons of biodiesel are very similar to the ones we talked about with ethanol. Um, Again, one of the major arguments here is that you could be you're using cropland, um, which could be going towards food. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the pros and cons of the solid biomass, meaning your trees and woods and crops. Um, pros are that they are potentially renewable as long as you're replacing them um, faster than you're harvesting them. Um, it can use waste, crop residues and leftover wood, so it could possibly prevent uh, waste going to landfills. It could be available to everyone and there's minimal technology required. The cons are that it encourages deforestation, um, erosion issues, indoor and outdoor air pollution, because uh, especially when you're burning those fires inside of little huts in developing countries, it releases a lot of carbon monoxide, particulates, your NOs, your NOxes, and possible toxic metals if we're burning uh, municipal solid waste. Okay, so then your pros and cons of your liquid biofuels, your ethanol and your biodiesel, uh, they are potentially renewable. Uh, they reduce dependence on fossil fuels. They can reduce our trade deficit. Um, and they're possibly not as environmentally damaging as fossil fuels. And the cons, like I said, these are kind of your big ones right here. Loss of agricultural land that could be going towards providing people with food which could lead to higher food costs as well. So they're saying it robs land um, and crops that could be going to food, less people are getting food, and there's possible higher food costs because of both of those. Um, they do get lower gas mileage as compared to your fossil fuel uh, liquids, and then they still release carbon, uh, carbon dioxide and methane gas. 
All right, and so then the very last topic we'll talk about on part one of the notes is using algae as a possible source of a biofuel. Uh, as I said, it's the new hotness, so it's considered the exciting new generation of biofuel crops. Um, and some of the excitement is that the fact that we can produce large amounts of lipids that can be converted into the biodiesel and their carbs could then be fermented into ethanol. So we can actually kind of double dip here and get two different types of biofuels from one type of organism. So here are all the things that people are excited about with algae. Uh, it can grow fast, very, very fast, much faster than terrestrial plants, especially like your crop plants. Uh, can be harvested every few days and replenished very quickly. Uh, farms could be set up pretty much anywhere and they can use all types of water. Uh, that you said you can set up these algae farms in like marginal lands where you're not really using it for anything else and they can't be used for anything else. They can be grown in brackish water. You could set up algae farms on rooftops of buildings because they're just little pools. So they can be set up almost anywhere. They can grow in lots of different types of water. And it says the nutrients to feed the algae can come from wastewater, which would be great because then you're taking care of some waste issues there. And then even smokestack emissions. So again, two different things that are normally put back into the environment as waste, we could actually use them as nutrients to feed our algae. Uh, we can use the cellulose part of the crop to ferment for ethanol so that the carb part can be saved as a food or energy source. So before when we were talking about, you know, oh, if you're using crops like corn to make ethanol, this kind of does away with that issue. They're saying we can use the carb part of uh, the algae to make as a food or energy source. Um, it's essentially carbon neutral and of course it is renewable. What are the major issues with algae as a type of biofuel? It's expensive, but they're saying they're getting a lot of private, se private sector investments. Um, people who are really excited about it, investing in it. Um, so hopefully that would bring the cost down so it wouldn't be an expensive technology for too much longer. Um, and it could require considerable amounts of land or water, even though we said that you can put these farms anywhere. Uh, here's an example of a type of algae farm. You can see it's huge pools of water, so it is taking up a substantial amount of land. So it all depends on the design, so it needs to be done smartly and efficiently in order to make it work. Um, and I think that is really about all I wanted to talk about in terms of biomass in part one of the notes. So with part two, we'll go ahead and pick up with um, hydropower and talk about our other forms of renewable energy.